the master of the mind games, Peter Manley. A word said there. Lewis has turned round. And now Lewis... Don't storm off. This is getting good. <laughs> I'm not Lewis. My name's not Lewis. <laughs> we'll get to that as well. <laughs> it was all in the press and the BDO had put in that if Peter plays that game with Jamie Harvey, we will ban him. I use Peter as an example because... I think he's done absolutely fantastic in what he's done because in my era when he was around, if I drew Peter right, I used to be thinking, who have I got next? But the booing started was obviously when I walked off a world final with uh, the second world final with Phil Taylor well, that's without a, shaking his hand. Reaching world championship finals. Now, unfortunately for you, Peter, you are reaching world championship finals in the era of the greatest player that's ever thrown a dart. And that was a problem. Talk to me about Phil Taylor. He's walking back and he's he's cracking, he's clicking his darts, and he's talking as he's coming past his shoulder. See, people wouldn't know all this, and it's and I'm thinking, do you know what? When he when he wins this, I'm just going to walk straight off. The funniest thing was going to Tesco's and, and getting booed at the bacon counter. You know, <laughs> did that never happen? Yeah, yeah it did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I said, is that right, Alex? I said, the wife's kicked you out. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm at my mum's and, and everything. I went, oh, you must miss your baby, though. <laughs> These are the darkest of art. A doctor described it as if you, me and you bought a brand new car, exactly the same, and you, I drove mine at 140 miles an hour and you drove yours at the speed limit, which one's going to go first? And that's where my life was. Welcome to The Dart Show. This week we are speaking to a titan of the game, a giant of this sport. Uh, controversial at times, uh, entertaining all the time, and often in bright pink. Uh, but not for today. It is One Dart, Peter Manley. Peter, thank you very much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Lovely. Look, Peter, you have lived quite a life entangled up with this sport and i'll just give you a word of warning right we did one of these with lloyd e. colin lloyd uh, another former world number one such as yourself uh, and we sat down for an hour and we talked about all you know his life and darts and everything else and then a week later we were working together on the pro tour right here at barnsley and we were sat having a chat at the hotel and he said did i ever tell you about that time i saved bobby george's life i saved him from drowning i was Lloyd, we spoke for an hour about your life and the significant events in it last week and you didn't mention a single word of that. So this is your forum, Peter, to tell us all of the exciting, mad and interesting stories over the course of your career. All I can say is I taught Lloyd how to uh, uh, <laughs> skate. <laughs> Did you hang one? Well, skate, yeah. skate, as yeah. in roller skates? No, on a, on, a, on a machine, one of those machines and... Uh, in Canada. In Canada? Yeah. Did it go well? No, he cleared off with all the others. Never did bother watching it. Well, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing about your skating exploits. But we've got to go right, right back. Um, so, childhood. Tell us about that. What was it like growing up as Peter Manley before we knew you as one dart? Well, obviously, it, 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 it's a different era and a different time. Um, I... My parents were quite strict in the in the fact that um, you know it, it, if you wanted to go down the the pub and play darts, you had to be eighteen. Mm. Well, the unfortunate thing is, I started when I was ten or eleven. <laughs> um, we was you know not wealthy by any means. Um, I realise now why my dad went painting and decorating every weekend after working all week to earn that extra back to keep us a clear and a head above water. Um, but our next door neighbours uh, built a, an extension. Mm. And in them times, it was really flash if you had an extension. And um, my dad had been out and bought one of them paper dartboards. Oh, yeah. And he'd stuck it on the wall. We had it, we had just had a lean-to. We didn't have proper extension. We had a lean-to. And we couldn't go out there if it was raining because you get soaked and, and, and everything. Um, and we'd, we'd play out there and I enjoyed it. Um, I loved the game, the, the, the 20, eventually the rain would come down and drip on the dartboard and the, the, the paper dartboard would bulge around about the 20. <laughs> but it didn't stop you playing. You know, you get all these players moaning now about this and that and you think, 
God, I love I love going out there and just playing on that paper dartboard. Were well, these some old brass darts? Were they? It, well, yeah, that's where I first started. I think everyone must, in my age, yeah. would have used them. And um, I had the old feather flights, and I used to love getting on my bike when I come home from school and nipping down to the fishing shop, and used to have to buy the washers to actually go in between because that was the only way of stopping them coming undone. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was when I was about 13, 14, um, I got my first copper tungsten set of darts. Fancy. Um, my brother-in-law's uh, brother, he'd uh, we'd gotten a holiday, I think it was Ponnings or Butlins, can't remember which one it was. And um, I had to buy him. He, he, he couldn't give them away. He couldn't afford to just give a set of darts away. They were six pound. A lot of money back then. I couldn't buy it. I didn't have six pound. Huh? I didn't have six pound. I, I had a paper round huh? and uh, I gave him 50 pence a week. And I bought this set of darts. And um, with this set of darts, uh, I carried on playing. And eventually I'd, I got to 16. And things had changed a, a little bit. And my dad took me to the pub on a Saturday when he went down there with his mates that he, he played darts with. And um, they, I'd sit there, but dad wouldn't let me play. Wouldn't let me play. <laughs> um, and then all the other lads are, come on, let him, let him have a game, let him have a game. Well, at the end, the last game they ever did, even if there was 25 of them, they'd all throw one dart at the ball. Who was nearest would go first, and they'd play one leg of a 1,001. And down they get, well, you know, you're talking 20 or pound for, for winning this. Well, I won it most weeks. It was... What, straight away? Like you yeah, were... it was, well, I am just... I loved it. I just, wow, to have that type I mean, I could never save to get a 10 bob note. And here I am at this pub and I can win, you know, 16, 17, depending on how many people were there. It was, it was fantastic. And obviously I'd, I'd look after my dad and, and give him some and, and everything. So it was great. It was a great start. So, and the, the likelihood of me doing actually well at that time um, was really... Uh, hard because Steve Brown, the, the American Steve Brown, yeah. was totally his game with his dad Ken, and um, I went to school very close to where Ken lived, and uh, we became good friends, and um, that sort of got me going and playing. So was it always <coughs> was it always darts for you then? Like obviously your your dad played. Um, was it was he good, your old man? Um, he was a good local player. Yeah, yeah. He, he could win the singles and things like that. But was it? Was there anything else competing for your attention when you were a kid? Or was it yeah, just darts, it, football. Darts, darts. Football. I love. I, I, know, I know people look at me now. I mean, I, I was left wing, and the only reason I was left wing was because I was originally right wing. But my mate didn't have a left foot, and I was very fortunate enough to be able to kick with both feet. So I went to the left wing so that they could pick me mate into the same side. Um, but. It came a time when I got married, first time, um, that something had to give. You were at darts Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, football Saturday, Sunday. Something had to give. It, it, and I thought, oh, I don't know, this all this running around a little bit is a little bit silly. <laughs> I, I must prefer to sit sit down and I'll just stand for a little while and play darts. And I played darts. Um, I didn't even play county darts for a while. I played for this local team uh, in New Walden that um, played on the same night mm. as Surrey Super League, but they kept asking me year after year to, to come. You won't get in this, you won't be able to do that. So in the end, I did have to leave and uh, so I could play county darts. But again, that wasn't for anything. Well, why am I playing county darts and I don't get paid? So what sort of, what sort of year are we talking here? Are we talking... 80s? Well, we're talking, we're talking, um, oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's when darts, darts is big time then. That's yeah. when darts is reaching. You see, it's bullseye on telly. It's, it's, it's a thriving local teams all over the place. Darts is, is big time then. But it's still, for 99.9% .9 of players, they're not thinking... I can make a career out of this. What are you thinking about life? Nothing. There, there was nothing at the time to give me any inkling to making a career. I had no intention. Well, the, the, you know, you, you saw the John Lowe's, Eric Bristow, the Jockey Wilson. And 
you know, okay, one of them was getting a big prize, but there wasn't a great, great deal. And mm. um, I did probably just through ignorance, didn't understand what you had to do, uh, how you had to get there. Didn't think it would, uh, you know, it would be fortunate for me to be able to do that. But uh, obviously it came my way in the end. Well, what, what are you, at that point, what are you thinking your life's going to turn out like? What, what's, you know, you end of your schooling, you got to go and get a job. you got to go and earn money. Yeah, I, I, I worked for uh, Perrings uh, in Kingston. It's a furniture shop. I was a junior salesman. Okay. Um, and this is probably where I started to end up being cute anyway. There was a, the, the top salesman of the company was there. And there was four salesmen and they all had their, they all had the um, because I was quite good at what I was doing and selling. Uh, in the end, they shoved me up to carpets, carpet department, because they were getting fed up with me selling too much. <laughs> um, but what I did was I got a very small percentage. So the company was actually loving it because they were paying me less. But then obviously what happened was um, they told me to put each sale down to each salesman in rotation. Right, so sharing your commission this, around, basically. This top, this top guy offered me another half a percent if I gave the big ones to him <laughs> and we'd, he'd turn around and we'd just say, well, I was doing it for Eric. I was doing it for Eric and um, he's, he's going to, you know, he gets this one. It was his customer. He asked me to look after him. So it wasn't long before I was ducking and diving even at that first stage. So, and, and then, of course, my me, me, me father went and bought uh, a news agent. And um, my mother had worked in this for a long time. And uh, they asked me to sort of like go and run it a little bit. I mean, I was only 16. So I, I think I was earning, I think my first wage was 20, 22 pounds. And I used to go, I used to go out drinking every night, get a bus to work, lunch every day when I, when I buy out, I'm 22 pound. Um, but my dad offered me 50 pound. So I like the sound of that. So yeah. here we go, we get the first stack system, stereo and, and everything. <laughs> Put yourself in debt and then you realize, oh, that was a bit silly. So you start sort of like learning about life quite early. Mm -hmm. And and it was at that point, really, I think it was 1995, when um, they'd run a, the, the BDO had run a competition, a Europe, a Unipart European Masters. And you had to win Super League, best player in the Super League, go to the Surrey finals, and I won that. Then you go to a regional final, and I won that. And it was myself and John Walton from Yorkshire mm -hmm. that uh, qualified. And cut a long story short, I got to the final and, and lost to the great uh, late Mike Gregory, 6 5. I mean, that. Do you feel that's the sort of breakthrough moment where you, can, you were convinced, hang on, I. I I can, I could really make this. I'm as good as these guys yeah, I even see on the telly. Listen, I think there must be thousands of people who sit at home and sit there and go, I can play like that. And to get the chance and the opportunity just to get up there and actually do it, that's half the battle. Mm. Um, I've got that battle done. I mean, I can remember that year being on holiday uh, with my wife and my daughter. And at lunchtime, gosh, the wife wanted something to eat. So oh dear, never thought of that. And uh, she went and got a couple of ham and cheese toasties. And I said, we can't do this every day. And like every other couple, we probably made them up with breakfast and, and nicked them. Yeah, yeah, um, standard. But that's how tough things were and hard in them days. And to actually get to, oh, well, I always remember I played Chill and Power Free and my first shot was 26 and I walked back and I took a deep breath and I went, what is the point of doing all this? And then I beat the likes of uh, Andy Fulham. Uh, it was where I got my nickname one dart off Tony Green. Right. It was in the game with Colin Monk where I hit every double with one dart, uh, even the bullseye. Um, but it was then that I, I played Ray Barneveld in the semi and he was obviously already a world champion and everything, and he was easy. <laughs> he was an easy guy. <laughs> um, and yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I never even, you know, I think it was 
I can remember it was 20,000 for the, for the winner and six for the runner-up. So £6,000 was a, a lot of money. Was that always the most... I mean, obviously, you'd love playing the game from a young age, but was the money, that's genuinely making a difference to you and your family's life there. Was that always the motivation? Were you playing the game because, look, I can really do with the cash, or were you playing the game because I just love it and I want to compete and I want to prove how good I am? I didn't play the game because I need the cash. I played the game to win the most money. And to win the most money, you had to win the event. So I never gave up. I didn't, you, you see all these nerves at the quarterfinal stages and the semi final. I didn't have any of that because to me, I hadn't done what I set out to do. I set out, and, and that's probably why um, I got beat in so many finals because I perhaps took a deep breath or, or whatever and, and it just let it all out and it, it didn't matter anymore. There was no other games to, to win and I just didn't have that mentality to get over the line in the final. Um, I know I did it once, but it's 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 very hard to to get that sort of mentality. But I would not play anything for nothing. County games, mm. I used to get dropped from Surrey. They said, "Sorry, you, you weren't here last." Uh, I, was, I said, "No, I was at a tournament." He said, "Well, that's why you dropped." And uh, next game, I'd go and I'd be picked and put in the side, and there'd be another tournament down the road for three hundred quid for the winner. And uh, I'd say to the guy, look, why don't you give him a chance? Like, I've been a bit naughty, but put him in. <laughs> they said, do you mind? I said, no, put him in. And I'd go disappear and I'd go and win £300. I really, I didn't play for England. I didn't play for international. People love playing for their country, and, and but for nothing. Oh, I love this. That's so different from most but, of the answers we get. But for nothing. What, what would you... You don't... You're not even doing this, Dan, are you, for nothing? Well, uh, practically, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, I am, actually. I think, <laughs> I think I am. So, Don't storm so, off. This is getting good. <laughs> I'm not Lewis. My name's not Lewis. <laughs> we'll get to that as well. <laughs> but it's, it, it's, it's what kept me going. It's, it was money. I mean, my, my first house, I could take you around my house, brand new fireplace, Ken Open. I won, I won the Ken Open. That, that paid for that. Ken, my f- I always... Remember, my dad, he used to give me money to go and play county. He said, don't be embarrassed when you're at the bar and you can't, you know, you're not with the lads and you can't make you stand your own drink and, and whatever. And he used to give me money, used to give it back to him if I didn't, didn't spend it. I said, I didn't spend that day, there you go. And, you know, we had a great relationship, my father and that, with, with the darts. And I could trust him if I ever asked anything. And I came home one day and I said, Dad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win one of these thousand pound ones. I said, that's, that's, me, that's me goal now, a thousand pound one. And um, it was Canberra Sands, mm-hmm. Pontins, Canberra Sands. They were quite, probably the biggest tournaments around. Yeah, they were big time back so then. So I beat Rod Harrington in the final. That must have felt good. Um, he did, because he's actually, he wanted tops before, I wanted one, two, five, and he wanted tops. And his last start went in and fell out. Oh! Ah, oh, the pain, it was, it, I, obviously, I was, I started laughing again after I hit the one two five, but I took out a one. I took the big finish out, and uh, you know he was okay with it. But he, he knew he, he should have won. But it, it was great, a thousand pound, and you get five hundred pound Pontins vouchers. You were selling them off to, you know, as long as you kept enough to pay for your next chalet the following year. It was uh, it was amazing, and then didn't really look back after that in the way of. You sort of used to worry, think, oh, well, the, the thousand pound one, there must be better players there. It didn't take me long to play in tournaments and they'd say, um, well, you just be a Super League player there. Mm. I was this news agent, just turned up and played, and I beat this Super League player. And I didn't, <laughs> didn't really take much notice of it until we were short one night and my dad was there, and the guy went, Does your dad play? I said, Well, he can throw a dart. He said, Well, he can play. I thought, well, that makes him a Super League player. <laughs> any, thought, any really play Super What am I doing worrying about Super League players? So are you, are you I mean, you said it's, it's all about that the money was the motivation. You, you'd like playing the game, but the money's the motivation. You're not interested in representing your country. Are you sort of convincing yourself tournament by tournament as you go to these bigger tournaments that I'm not sure there's many people around that I'm not better than? No, that doesn't... That's still too early. Still far, far really? too early for... 
for that type of thing to come in because you're still watching these guys month in, month out, or whenever they're on telly, mm. um, and you're not one of them. So it, it's quite, it was quite a big break. It was quite a big break from that 1995, and I think it was the PDC that put on a Yorkshire board tournament. Mm-hmm. And, so uh, no trebles, just the doubles just on the, the double on, Yeah, and it was a thousand pounds to the winner, plus a place at the world match play. And well, I won it. Like, long story short, I won it. I think I beat Phil Gilman in the final. Um, won it quite convincingly, quite easy. Um, and then I played um, a guy from America. Uh, I can't think of his name at the moment. And the postman of won the news of the world. Um, and then I lost to Jamie Harvey when he got the TV stage. Mm-hmm. But there was a lot of rigmarole that went on before that game with Jamie Harvey, where it was all in the press and the BDO had put in that if Peter plays that game with Jamie Harvey, we will ban him. So I was part of that. Not as bad as the original 13 that broke away, but now I'm being told where I can play and where I can't play. Well, what was that like? Because that at that time, with the split, and it, it, was, it was real bile being spat at people from both sides of the argument, wasn't it? There was some real... I mean, the late Tommy Cox, who was you know, instrumental in setting the PDC, he would even say, you know, they, they tried to take my house. They tried to put me out of house and home, me and my family. It was... it would, Battle lines were drawn, and you had to pick a side, and that put players in very difficult positions. Yeah, I, I, I didn't... At the time, I didn't really understand. Uh, I didn't know what they'd done, obviously. Um, you find out these things, like you just said there. I mean, obviously, they must have been through hell, but I, that, that didn't bother me. They, they, weren't, they weren't me. Um, and... So really, what happened was was no one was going to tell me. I mean, it was fifteen grand, I think, the first prize. I think it was fifteen grand. It, it, it was five, sounds about right. I think it was five hundred pound. I was on five hundred pound, which I thought was fantastic at the time for first round losers. Mm. Uh, was it ten grand? Now? Was it ten grand? Yeah, it is. Yeah, Friday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you got in the game at the wrong time, I, Peter. Uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> um, but it's. I forgot where we were. Well, now. you didn't. You didn't like being told what you could and couldn't do. No, and that, and that was that was really it. And so I decided that this opportunity. I'm a news agent. I, th- I thought I'm still a news agent. I'm not anywhere near a dark player. So let's give it a go. So that's what I did. I I got a guy that uh, paid me away, and it, that, in them days it was very hard. I'd never really had anyone. Um, pay for me to go anywhere mm. uh, we actually worked on a, a 50-50 basis but the PDC only had tournaments in America the majority of them was in America mm. I couldn't afford to go to America Yeah, but I wanted to play well, now it's a point... case of just wanting to play now I knew that if I could go there and I could win and, and whatever um, but I mean it's it's I'm, I made money. I'm, I'm not. I'm not a silly person. And when I go to America for the first time, I'm not just sitting around just wasting my time. I'm talking to some of the Americans. I find out they've got business. They're, they're business, in business, playing, uh, making darts or selling darts and stuff. And um, I got my first darts made by a Retriever in Slough, and I went there. And the guy said to me, he said, oh, you don't want, to, you don't want your darts. He said, uh, no, it could cost a lot of money. You don't want your darts. I said, what if I pay you? He'd never had a player pay him before. He'd always given them darts mm. and never got anything back. And he got badly treated. I said, I'm not going to treat you back. I'm going to treat you how you should be treated if you make me darts the way I want them made. Mm-hmm. And he made me darts. And I think me darts cost me all packaged and everything. Uh, just over two pound. So was that because you wanted a dart in a certain way, or was that because you wanted a dart in a certain way that you could then flog copies of to people and make yes. some money? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, everything everything I ever did was about making money. And because with this retriever, they were a, a massive, massive company. I think they still are. I think they're still in business. Um, 
But these guys in America, the prices of stuff in America, even in them days, was if a, if a stem was 20 pence here, it would be a pound in, a, in America. All the taxes and so and stuff. So I could quite easily sell a stem for 40 pence in America. So if I bought, if I took a thousand pounds worth of stuff with me, I'd make a thousand pounds. So did you just take another suitcase just packed full of darts yeah. gear that you would then set up a shop, essentially? The risk obviously is getting through with it. But, uh, <laughs> did it, that ever go wrong? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your sort of first, f- I mean, going to America, that, that's a big deal back then, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, where, um, where would you, how far had you been well, previously? That, uh, never, uh, well, just England, UK. No, without um, the country, and all of a sudden maybe, going to America. Yeah. Well, yeah, Chicago. I mean, I was in, say I was a news agent. People, we, I'd leave on a Friday, and I'd be back in the shop uh, Tuesday morning because you you'd fly home Sunday, get home Monday, so you'd be back Tuesday morning. And people would say, "Oh, what was it like?" I said, "Well, I landed at the airport. Yeah, got a taxi to the hotel." <laughs> come out the hotel got a taxi to the airport and I come home <laughs> yeah, yeah. oh you didn't see any of it then I went no nah. no it may as well have been but tell a lie <laughs> tell a lie actually because that first year uh, we had a little bit of time on the Monday before the flight and there was a lot of us all went into the town in Chicago which was an hour and a half away on the train Mm. And who did I sit next to? You'd never guess who I sat next to. I do, well, enlighten me, Peter. Phil Taylor. <laughs> we had a fantastic chat, you know. Um, it was great for me to listen to what someone else had gone through and, you know, him actually admitting the fact that he couldn't even get in his dad's Sunday night team, you know, to start with, and it, where it all come from. Mm. And we've already mentioned the success and whatever of Peter Wright well I use Peter as an example because I think he's done absolutely fantastic in what he's done because in my era when he was around if I drew Peter Wright I used to be thinking who have I got next <laughs> and not in a nasty way I didn't mean that in a nasty way no, but, but that's what I did so his achievement of what he's done now I, I respect so much because he must have worked so hard to get to where he is now. Mm. I think there's a lot of parallels between Peter Wright and, and Phil Taylor in how they have had to work to turn yeah. themselves into the players they are. Did you have to put that work in? Or was all your work about the hustle of where you could make the next pound? Well, to be honest, I, I really was one of those guys that would turn up and say, well, if it's my day. And then, and then when I joined the PDC, um, I partnered uh, Jamie Harvey to start with. And we had a great time. We, had, we, we won lots of money in uh, races in, uh, in America. Um, and then Just for anybody who doesn't know, explain what races are. Well, so just money games. Just yeah. money games. So uh, Americans would always, even the worst American, it was, I loved it. The worst <laughs> American would come up and say, give me a game for 50 bucks. And, and it wasn't a problem. You know, it, it was like, and I'll tell you what, you, you've even, you, we've even got Eric Bristow chalking going three ways he's not silly is he so that's how so you learn you learn <clears throat> but the it was soon after that the world number four uh peter everson now he lives about 40 miles away he said to me he said um it, him and rod they, they they play pairs all over the world but they'd, they'd had a fallout and so peter was looking for a partner and he'd asked me now don't get me wrong, I was probably ranked about number 37, but there was probably only 40 players, I think, in there at the time. <laughs> I don't just started. Um, so I was quite honoured, but he turned around to me and he said, um, you can only partner me if you come and practice with me twice a week. So I'm thinking, you know, it's an 80-odd-mile 80, 80 round trip twice a week, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. So anyway, I learned some routines off Peter. Practice right. routines. Went over and I practice, and we'd be all night. We'd be all night. I'd, I'd get there for seven, seven thirty, and I'd be home by eleven, eleven thirty. So it was, it was a good session. We'd put the um, the practice training board, one with the smaller doubles and trebles, mm-hmm. and we'd play a little routine on there for half hour or so, and then we'd put the the, the main board up and quite a lot massive. App. You couldn't miss it. You just couldn't miss it after yeah. doing doing it in that routine. Not continuing all night with it but just doing it in that routine and then 
from the weeks we were practicing, I would ring Peter and I would say, um, Peter there, I said, um, just want to sort out one night we're practicing. Oh, he's, um, he's out running at the moment. Oh, he's gone, he's, he's swimming. I know he's at the gym. And I think, all oh, these things, really? <laughs> <laughs> do people do that? And <laughs> that's where I went wrong in life. And I paid the price ultimately later on in the game, which we, we'll talk about later. Mm. But it's um, six months of complete, twice a week with Peter and playing tournaments. We'd win French Open pairs. We'd, we were doing really, really well. But what I, what I found and I noticed was all of a sudden, 164's finishes were just coming out of the woodwork. They, they used to be like a, as, as Kevin Painter would say, well, you don't ever get that one in 100, uh, and it's against me. But um, the, the 164's were the regular. They were coming, not like they're doing today, but it, 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 it showed, you knew you were doing something. And so that practice alone stood me in good stead going forward but what Peter taught me other than just the practice was the mannerisms and he taught me to actually win a tournament without actually talking to anyone he said you don't go to a tournament to make friends you don't go there you go there to win it mm -hmm. and that was right on my street because that's all I wanted because that's where the money was yeah. I've already said that and that's what I did. And people would beat me and I would say something to them and they would walk away going, did I win that game? <laughs> <laughs> because I'd know I'd get them the next time. And if I didn't get them the next time, I'd get them the time after that. It didn't bother me that. You know, people would say, I'll beat you eight times. I don't care, you beat me 28 times. It's this one that's important. I mean, have you always had that approach um, or is that something you learnt is that something you put on when you when you came you went right okay I'm going to give this a go I'm going to be a darts player I'm going to be play on this tour with all the professionals I, I learned very quickly and this day and age players don't learn they think they know they they don't they, they, they got to learn I was world number one and I was still learning one of the pairs I played with Everson uh, was a French pair and he took out a big shot um, and he, he roared in my face, turned around and roared in my face. And they went 2-1 up. And I took even a bigger shot out and I turned around and I roared even bigger in his face. Peter Everson turned around to me and said, we haven't won yet. And I Save thought, it for the end. Well, yeah, and, it's, and there's an example there was... When I did look after a player, Wes Newton, he had a nine data, and he jumped around that stage, but he was probably knackered for the next two legs. <laughs> you know, so it just shows you, 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 you had nine data, you haven't won a game. Luke Humphrey's done it in Beauty Pets. Yeah, he did. Doesn't, very doesn't win you the game, does it? It doesn't. Um, what did, once you'd got on the PDC tour, and now there's this trips to America, there's, there's going and finding ways of making money. What's going on with the, the day job, the news agent? I mean, is that, are you still managing to do all this? Yeah, well, that, that, that final in the uh, European final, I had the BBC cameras in the shop. I was doing the papers Sunday morning, and I was playing Gregory at uh, 2 o'clock. <laughs> you know, I was doing the papers, so they came in the shop. Right, they paid me under a pound, the BBC. To, <laughs> to do you even manage to get a few quid out? Oh, of course. <laughs> you, you got to get every little bit... I. I was clever enough to be yeah, able to get something for. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's where I was with the TV. What about playing on TV? Because that, that, it's a new thing and it's a different thing and it's not to everybody's tastes, but you seem to absolutely love being on a big stage, Peter. Yeah, I... Obviously, the, the, the booing and the pantomime villain, that, that sort of didn't come, come in straight away. No, you don't. Um, but I, I get knocked down, I get up again. Probably wasn't always going to be the best song that was ever going get, to get me anywhere. And, and my wife loves music and 70s and, and whatever, and she was, like, working on... And, of course, Peter Kay done the, 
Amarillo mm -hmm. for the for the comic relief, and um, I sort of copied it. And from then on, it changed. Um, but the booing started was obviously when I walked off a world final with uh, the second world final with Phil Taylor, well, that's without a, shaking his hand. Yeah. So by this point, you've got to being one of the best players around, one of the very best players around, reaching world championship finals. Now, unfortunately for you, Peter, you are reaching world championship finals in the era of the greatest player that's ever thrown a dart. And that was a problem. Talk to me about Phil Taylor. Well, it was, but... Uh, and, and that's probably why I sort of built up the love-hatred thing with Phil, because... Again, I wasn't going to invite him for Sunday tea. Been taught that. Um, and I needed to beat him. Um, I can remember the 1999 World Match Play. Um, in the old days, we all sitting there in the press room now. Mm -hmm. That used to be the VIP and uh, Unicorn were the, the, the top dogs then. And, and obviously with Phil being their main man was, was in, that, in that category. So... I remember going so clear. I got that five or six legs clear, but he came back, and he came back to fourteen all. And I, and I really, really was panicking a little bit. And I thought, come on, keep calm and, and everything. I went sixteen fourteen, and I think I think it was Lloydie actually done it in, in your interview, where you turn round and you think you've won. Yeah. And Phil was standing there. And it was funny, I, I put my hand out and didn't just brush it. Because at the time, I had a pine in the middle <laughs> and I was able to, to just brush it through. And we went off for a break. And I walked in this VIP room with the top guys from Unicom, Edward Lowy and his, his brother Richard. And uh, I said, can I have a beer out of the fridge? He said, All right. Yeah, help yourself. I'm sitting on the arm of the uh, green uh, Chesterfields. That I think it's still there, aren't they? Um, and I, I was leaning back and drinking it and I said hey this lad of yours he's not bad is he <laughs> <laughs> always remember that and I mean it wasn't long after Unicorn sponsored us so I don't know whether that obviously had anything to do with it or, or whatever is, is this an affectation Peter is, was it always a, like you putting on a character to be in a dance or was this just you like when it was me, like, the thing was I, I I didn't like to enjoy I did like fun there was always a smile on my face I was never down or grumpy or you see them now they're all so grumpy aren't they but just smile enjoy it I mean Ray Barnabas needs to and he's doing it and he's in, he's loving it again he's loving life and loving does and that's the way it was for me in in them days just to just get up there and enjoy it um having said that there were times when it was not the most friendly up there on the stage. The World Championship final with Phil, the, the second one where you walked off, that's kind of the origins of where fans started to boo you. What were you, what were you feeling there? I mean, apart from gutted at well, losing in the World Final. I'd already been beat by him 6-2 uh, a couple of years previous in the first World Final, and uh, I was quite looking forward to it, but... Um, some friends of mine, we, we were celebrating perhaps a little bit too long and wasn't quite right uh, before I knew it. I mean, people said, get in the field early. He's, that's when he's, he's... And the first leg, he's taking out 164s and 170s. So, you know, that, that's, that's a load of tosh. And then you're five nil down and you think... And he's, he's walking back and he's, he's, crack, he's clicking his darts and he's talking as he's coming past your shoulder. See, people wouldn't know all this and it's... And I'm thinking, do you know what? And I, I'm actually throwing in the world final, but I'm thinking, do you know what? When he wins this, he, norm he always ran one, that one way, then he'd run the other way. And then he might think about the opponent after a, a little while. And I thought, do you know what? When he, when he wins this, I'm just going to walk straight off. And, well, what did he do? He, he hit the winning double and he... Instead of running that way and that way, he turned around and shake me hand, <laughs> but I've gone. Um, and yeah, when I came back on, I, I, I got the booze. Um, but I, when I next played again on TV and got the booze, I knew that I've got to work with this and I can work with this 
to my advantage. I knew that I wasn't the type of player Phil Taylor was. It's champions, it's, it's, it's brilliant champions. And you could see the difference in Phil Taylor and me. I didn't want to live my life like him. I wanted to be the person I was. I wanted to do exactly, go everywhere I wanted without having to worry and, and everything. And it, it was just, just something that, um, that I just really just sort of like wanted to, wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, you, you accept the, look, I, I, I didn't want to be Phil Taylor and look, Nobody was ever going to be Phil Taylor. The man was a freak in this sport. But when the crowds did start to turn on you, and you say, like, oh, this is something I can use, I've got to work with this, and then find a way to make it work for me. That's still a very difficult thing to deal with, though, isn't it? When it keeps on going oh, for was, a while. Did it was, not bother you? I was now on my second marriage, and it was quite easy to ignore the wife, so it's just a case of uh, another 9,998 people that I had to ignore. <laughs> but it... it it was it was so easy for me to do, to switch off, and it's all about playing in like a trance, where it's just you and that dartboard. Mm. It's not you and the ten thousand people that are booing you. But I was using that to my advantage. I know I probably get told off for that now, coming back from the hockey and giving it, you know, while they're booing, while the other players throw it. You know, it, it, there was so many things that you could actually do. Um, the funniest thing was going to Tesco's and. And getting booed at the baking counter, you know. <laughs> did that never happen? Yeah, it did, yeah. yeah <laughs> it did. It is. But it's, um, no, it's, it's, it's something that I knew I was never, ever going to be a Phil Taylor. And you've already said that he's the greatest of all time. And I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, we, we've, we've spoken now, and I'll take my hat off to the guy. Yeah, no one will do whatever he done because they're all matching good averages. In in that, in my day and my era, where Phil was there, he was out on his own. Mm. If he produced darts, no one else could get anywhere near it. But what was it? What was it like being part of that then? Because you know, as you say, you know, like, I'm here to make money. The reason I'm here is to win and make money, to win things. Well, and this bloke, yeah, but keeps on. That's beating. that's where the ranking, that's where the ranking system, the the point system, helped me, because. From about October, I would start working out where I would be in the other half. Other half of the draw? For the Worlds. Yeah. Because the Worlds, to me, there was only him that could beat me. If I was on my job, he was the only guy. We still had strong Dennis Priestley's, Bob Anderson's, and they were always going to be hard to beat, believe it or not. Uh, shows, shows just what if his name Shanks from Holland or, or the South African that uh, that beat us first round. Um, so it was always going to be be hard and difficult. But um, no, I loved it. Well, what, what's that feeling like then? Because if you've got to a point in the game where you think, I am genuinely as good, if not better, than every single player on earth, apart from one. Apart from one, I've still got to number one in the rankings. I've done that a couple of times, and that's that's in in itself is a is a massive achievement. Although, do you feel like you game the system it yourself? Still, still boils down to the same fact. I'm still working on the same principle. There's one player that's better than me. So, what's the next best prize? The runner-up spot. Yeah, I got there three times. I got the semi-finals as well. Um, so I was close to adding to the three I got. So what I was doing was right. Obviously, it's a bit difficult now with money. You can't do as much. It's probably not so much movement. Someone's 8,000 in front, that's hard to catch up. You've got to win an event and, and whatever. Mm. With the points, it was just a case of, well, as long as if, I, if, I, if I do lose and he wins, then I said, Andy, I'll go down in the other half. So what did it feel like to be world number one, even in the year of Phil Taylor? Did well, you always? Did you just think? Well, the great. The, I think the thing really that excited me just on being number one was taking it off Rod Arrington. <laughs> you know, it, it, seeing his face as, uh, you know, he it, it had a car. He, he got a car at the, the the hotel where we all stayed at Blackpool. We had a players' hotel in them days, and he had Rod Arrington, world number one, 
And I said, can I, can I go and scratch that? Can I go? You touch my car. <laughs> and it, it was quite funny. But uh, no, but the thing was, I was number, he, he beat us, but I was always, because of the points he was defending and whatever, I, I was always going to go number one. Let's talk about Vegas, Peter. Um, I mean, arguably, what, your biggest win? Yeah, it's the only, only TV win. Well, but so. it's, and, and it's a special place for you, isn't it? You absolutely adore Vegas. Yeah, You're married there, all sorts. Well, that was afterwards. That was uh, oh, after it, the it's renewing your vows or something. No, it's uh, I, 2003. I, I won Vegas, mm. um, but I beat the world champion when I won that TV. You know, John Park had beaten Taylor in the semi. I'd, I'd absolutely smashed Colin Lloyd in the semi. Um, He'd, he'd had a rap with me. He wanted a. a, a, a I, was fi- I think I was 5 0 up after the first session. And he lifted his shoe up as to say, I've trodden in something. And uh, I, I don't keep quiet. And he chased me down into the toilet in the break. And he chased me. And he says, If you want it that bad, you can have it. And Freddie Williams, who was a referee at the time, he, 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 was, he come chasing down with Colin as well. And I said, Hear that, Fred? That's it. It's all over. <laughs> okay, right. There's Peter Manley. Let's do Peter Manley's top three arguments with dark players. So, ba 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 ba. We'll put jingles on it and everything. In at number three, uh, what are we going to go for? Are we going to get Ad Lewis? Should we talk about Ad Lewis? Number three. I wonder. I want to put him that low, actually. Okay, you'd be higher. Okay. Well, yeah, I think it'd be higher. Yeah. Well, we'll have Colin Monk, <laughs> <laughs> Phil Taylor. There must be loads of Phil Taylor. A.D. Um, Lewis is the one everybody talks about. A.D. Lewis the, the, walked off. The thing off. is, it was like um, people actually, if you had a house by a river, an insurance man would knock at your door and sell you insurance in case you get flooded. It hadn't been a flood for 500 years, but he'd sell it to you. If he was a good salesman, he'd sell it to you. And you'd think, sure, oh, you think, sure, you'd have go. <laughs> so, a dark, I mean, I used to go practicing in, in Vegas, especially Vegas. They'd set the practice boards up and they'd be back on back. And normally my opponent would be the other side. And <laughs> I'd, I'd shout over. I'd shout over. I mean, I played Alan Tabern one game and he walked back and he spoke. He didn't mean, he, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He just spoke. And I stopped and I turned around and said, right, you're having it now. And he said, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. But he was standing behind me when he got the chance. I'm sorry, sorry. So, so I knew that I got him and he was worried. And it's like, I think Alex Roy would have been the best one in a UK Open um, quarterfinal. Mm. Um, I find out everything about a player. I knew exactly everything. Now, it's a bit like Man United playing Juventus. They wouldn't play Juventus without having someone from Man United going and watching a few games to know who their strong points are. So that's what I would do. And I played Alex Roy. And he did not long had a, uh, another baby. I don't know whether it was second, third, tenth, eleventh. I have no <laughs> idea. Um, but he, he was 3-2 up at the break. And I said, is that right, Alex? I said, the... Wife's kicked you out. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm at my mum's and, and everything. I went, Coy, you must miss your baby, though. <laughs> These are the darkest of arts. You must, you must miss that. But every time I look at that 60, I'll be seeing my baby. <laughs> I don't think you want another leg. <laughs> right. This, it was all just mind games. It was That's e- really where I could... Yeah. I would say a hundred things and hopefully one of them might it's about putting you off what you're doing I mean I played we, we go back to me mate Phil I can remember playing him in, in Ireland on the floor in one of the Pro Tour events and I wanted 180 something I 140 elite tops he's on double 10 well just to walk back and do nothing just didn't seem right. <laughs> so I always remember saying to Phil, you got to get it. And he went to me, shut up. I said, you shut up. <laughs> and 
<laughs> don't get me wrong. He turned playground. He turned around. He bang double ten. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, that was a problem it's with a, Phil. But I actually felt I've got a chance if I can try and get in his head. And but but he was very hard to get in because he, you know, he'd do his own little bits. I mean, obviously he's been looked after by Eric, and Eric wasn't shy either. Well, so, exactly. I mean, it's, it, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, Eric Bristow was. I was, didn't do anything that I felt was. Uh, it wasn't in the rules. It was nothing in there to say I couldn't say anything or do anything. It's gamesmanship, right? Yeah. But it's yeah. not cheating. Um, I don't know. So I think Sid would later would they'll call it cheating um, with Lewis. Mm. Um, well, talk us through that incident. Because what happened there? Well, <laughs> from, from my respect, um, I was actually winning the game. Now, if you go back to the beginning of the tournament, Sky had just made it so obvious that all they wanted was a Lewis Taylor final. His young man that he's been training up and, and everything. But he's playing me now. He's, he's got me. And um, what I've what I done was... Um, I, I played well. Oh, that was surprised me. I played well. And I was in front. I was actually beating him. No problems whatsoever. And then I wanted to double, and I could hear him tutting. Now, you're at Perfleet, so, OK, it could have been the guy down the front of the crowd. They were that close. But I'd like to think I was a little bit... I knew it was... So I turned around and said, can you stop tutting? Now, that, that could quite easily have been the end of it, and whatever. Uh, and he went up and uh, he, I missed, and he got it, and he complained to Russ. And uh, I thought, what's he complaining about? All I asked him to was stop telling. Just he could have just said okay or or I didn't and, and just carried on playing. But he didn't. Um he walked over the drinks and he, he's looking at me and he's uh oh, this and um, and whatever and I'm thinking, get on with it, what's the matter with it? Just get on with it. And he walked over, he looked at me and he went up the throw and obviously you hear me, people have seen it, they, you know, they hear me mutter some words. Um they all say, I'm, I'm, I'm have, you're having it large. But it wasn't. It was, you're having a laugh. That's why I actually said, you're having a laugh. Because what I was saying was, get on with it. Mm. You know, stop. Stop it. Get on with it. Well, obviously, I didn't know he was going to walk off. But he said in his interview with uh, Helen Chamberlain, I think, later on, that Phil told me to... Uh, walk off if any antics from Peter. All I asked him to do was stop tutting. I didn't, you know, it wasn't trying to, I wasn't even putting him off on it because he was behind me. Did you feel that like you'd got this reputation and it got to such a thing where you didn't actually have to do that much and it would still just wind oh, people yes. up and get in yeah, their heads? Yeah, it was fantastic. It sort of sorted itself yeah. out. You, yeah. you just sort of set this, created this persona, people are expecting it, you just have to chuck in three words and then they, they just head melts. Well, I think the guy you've interviewed first, Wayne, I think he was one of the first to that I really noticed that looked frightened to play me. And that was the Premier League at Reading. And um, the unfortunate thing from that is probably one of the most upsetting things in the, in the end, because we were, were mates. I mean, I, I was his best man, and mm. he was father and bride at our wedding. Um, and we didn't finish Vegas, did we? We did. Oh, we're rabbling, aren't we? We're rabbling. <laughs> but... He, he then wrote in his book that I cheated. And that's probably the most upsetting thing I have I feel from the darts. But I'm big enough to be able to take something like that, that from someone at the time, he probably didn't know what he was doing anyway. So, you know, as much as I love him, you know, he, he was wrong. And I proved him wrong. Well, the thing is... You admit is there's, there were there were little things you could do. There's more than one way to win a game of darts, but ultimately you don't you don't get to world number one. You don't get to repeated world finals without throwing world class darts. Do you look back? Are you happy with what you achieved? Do you feel you underachieved? Do you feel you overachieved? I think you've only really got to look at what I've won and and how close I've been. In different people would love to have what I've got and what I've done. Um, and what I've achieved. And the thing is, I'm still working now. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't want a diary full of exhibitions. I like doing the, the exhibition still. I like having a laugh. But people, obviously, they've got to understand I'm not the Peter Manley that was in, 
year 2000. It's, you know, that's gone. But we can still have a laugh. And, you know, I, I just joke, I say, well, if you can't beat me now, that just shows you how bad you are. You know? Well, I'm quite interested. You are not the Peter Manley that you were back then, because now you're the Peter Manley who heads up the Players Association. Well, yeah. Now, that is, that. if somebody had said back you know, 25 years ago, you'll be doing that job, you'd have been laughed out of town, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I, well, that came about just simply when I when I went PDC, mm. because there wasn't so many tournaments. Um, I'd moved up with Chrissy from Surrey, I mean, to Carlisle in the Cumbria, and she was a dart player as well. Um, and she had a totally different attitude to my first wife, and I don't think I would have done anywhere near as good as what I've done without her. Mm. Especially by my side and understanding and being able to talk darts and in the sense of how well you're done. I mean, I took her to Saskatoon when I first moved up and she won it. And it was twenty five thousand Canadian dollars. She was earning only earning six and a half thousand a year. And there I took her to this darts and, and you know, but a year into our relationship we thought we was gonna have to look for a job. We I moved up and said, we'll give it a couple of years. But there wasn't the money around in darts. She wasn't winning. And I won the Irish Open. And it got me into Blackpool. And I was that's when it made me world number one. Mm. And I got my first sponsor. See, all these guys now, you talk to a young guy now, that I've got to get himself a manager and a sponsor. And I'm thinking, well, you want to be, you want to be reasonable. You want to be reasonably good before you even think about it. But then if you're reasonably good... Why do you want to waste <laughs> huge chunks of your yeah, money? Yeah. Get yourself a sponsor that might not want anything back or a, a company that's going to look after you. But go straight in with someone that wants something back. You, you know, I never went to work to come come away with giving majority of it away. And the thing is now, they smile at it. They laugh. They come back, yeah, I've got to give him that. And they laugh. And I'm thinking, we well, don't have to. What, um, what is your role now like as the... The PDPA, the Players Association, you're there representing their interests. It's you, You've got to be the very different Peter Manley from the Peter Manley who's well, out was, for himself and I was every chairman, pound coin. I was chairman when I was world number one, and I took over from Dennis Priestley, and I learned so much off Dennis. And and can I just say what? It was a pleasure to have worked under Dennis and seeing how honest he was. And that's really all I've try to achieve is honesty because if, if if I think if Barry Earn had found out or done anything that I thought I wasn't anywhere near up for the job I don't think I'd be there I don't think I'd have been there 20 years um, so I think I've done a, a reasonably good job um, we took we had nothing uh, when I took over from Dennis there just wasn't the money around and we got like over a million pound in our, our little funds so We've done extremely well and, you know, we look to change things because all we ever did was talk about the, the length of the dartboard, was it the hockey moving, was the lighting okay? Whereas now, today, you're looking at uh, mental health, wellness, uh, anxiety, depression, gambling, it's integrity, it's it's massive, absolutely snowballed. And it's like running a, a, a small little company. You know, you, you've still got insurances to pay, you got rates to pay you got so someone's got to do it someone's got to do there in the office and, and be there and do it and i think we've got a very good team that have, from, from people that we've got in and you know we're still looking for another player or whatever to to come on board so we got their their input as well well do you ever i mean from your position now you look back on on your playing career with the win in vegas and the world championship finals and the world number one spot and you now heading up the PDPA, representing an increasingly professional game that is going all over the world. Do you look back and think, this is utterly mad that in another universe, I'd have still been the news agent, piling up the papers at silly o'clock in the morning? Well, yeah, but that's, that's how things grow. And, and you've, you've already mentioned uh, the late Tommy Cox. I mean, he was a great friend of mine. You know, to, for him and Dick Alex to bring Barry Hearn to, to Perfleet was, you know, fantastic. And for Barry to, to see what what we could... I mean, I could have bought some shares 
I'm, I'm, I'm gutted. I never bought any shares. <laughs> I, I just moved and I was going through a divorce. Um, and I, I just didn't have the money to, to buy shares. You know, it, uh, and I mean, you know, they're worth a fortune now. They are. Although I think you've done all right over the years, Peter. Yeah, I've been sensible and I, I try and put players, uh, you, you, you said it yourself there, from being the bad boy. Well, because a lot of players nowadays, they're all new. They don't remember. They don't remember me playing, uh, which is good in a, in a way of for the job that I do at the PDPA. Whereas at the beginning, it was very hard to to do something with someone that the, two years ago I was trying to put him off. Um, <laughs> but I, I wore two hats. I wore two hats. I was a player, but I, t I take the job very, very seriously. I don't mess about a bit, you know. Uh, there's, there's a time and a place and um, I love what I do and it's, it was my way. I mean, I did the job for oh, it's a number of years, probably seven, eight years where I, I didn't get paid. I didn't do it. From, it wasn't about money. It wasn't about money. Um, it was about me probably just trying to give a little bit of something back to the game. But because at 47, um, I remember... I remember uh, going to Cheltenham races and I had a problem walking back up the hill to get out. I was out of breath. Got in a taxi, got to my friends. It was a players' championship at Crawley for the weekend. I managed to get through that, but I lost 6-0 to John Park and he, he was laughing and joking. I said, John, I don't feel well. I said, I'm out of breath. And he was just laughing and just saying, no, you're just making excuses. I went to the doctors when I got home and I had an ECG and the nurse came in and said, I've called the doctor. Don't worry, nothing to worry about, but I've called the doctor. And I've got two nights in Redcar and two nights in Edinburgh. So I'm really quite a busy week and, and whatever. And the doctor came in and he said, uh, I've called an ambulance. He said, what do you mean? I've got a car outside. He said, you're seriously ill. Felt all right, just a little bit out of breath, and I had trouble sleeping, laying down, couldn't breathe, and, and whatever. And uh, I was diagnosed with heart failure in the end. Um, it was basically a doctor described it as if you, me, and you bought a brand new car, exactly the same, and you, I drove mine at 140 miles an hour, and you drove yours at the speed limit. Which one's going to go first? And that's where my life was. I didn't realise I was doing too much. I got a massive contract with Betfred to, to play in their shops. Uh, that was something else I worked at when I got beat first round in the UK Open. Mm. Betfred were doing the uh, book at, um, at the Bolton Wanderers Ground. And I went over to them and I said, do you know what, there's millionaires in this audience. I said, they're gonna rip you apart. They had four or sixes where they can just afford to go and put money on and treble it up. I said, they said, well, can you come and... So I went round the back and then I turned around to the guy and I said, I've got a great idea for your shops. And he said, well, I'm a bit busy. He said, can I see you tomorrow? So I told the wife, Chrissy, at the time, she said, well, what's your idea? I said, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I was with them for years, but I had to bring Tommy Cox to come in and negotiate it. Now, he, he negotiated a deal probably three times the amount that I would have got, I would, I would have been happy with originally. Because mm -hmm. you've got to imagine this is like during the day, which is, this is fine. But I was doing them on a, when I was in the Premier League, I was doing them on the day of the Premier League. Well, which you can't do now. You can't yeah, do that but you're a busy game. boy. I mean, no wonder you were putting yourself through the ring. Well, yeah, How was, did that diagnosis change things, though, for you? Um, it was about six, seven, eight months before I, I sort of came back. But the head still tells you you're the best player in the world. But I can remember losing 6-5 to Justin Pipe in one of the first tournaments. Um, and I came back and sat down. But I got up about half an hour later and I couldn't have played another game. My body uh, was... Was that out. when you knew it was... Yeah, I knew it was, yeah, knew it was tough. I couldn't do it. Was um, it difficult with a game that you played all, all those years to just go, 
That's I've not paid the for price now. for not looking after myself, and that's where it still comes back to me. Where even in the early days when I rang Peter Everson and he was at the gym swimming, running, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't think I do things like that. And you have to do it. You look at Gerwin Price today, and you'd back him all the time if there was a great long time because you'd feel he'd be the one to sustain. So, I mean, from the, the bad boy of darts, as you called yourself earlier, you're now, you're now trying to get them to all behave and be good boys and girls. Well, not necessarily behave. You know, they step out of line. They know they've stepped out of line. And then now the DRA is going to come down on them. But the things I do and I notice, which is totally, I, I look at a guy and I, I, I listen to him as I walk past and they went, oh, I'm struggling to pay the bill. I just had an extension done. And I think, struggling to pay the bill? What's, well, he must have a massive. And it wasn't. He might have owed 10 grand or something. And, but he's won over 2 million. And I can't understand these guys who have won over two million, what they're doing with a mortgage. Why have they got a mortgage? What are they doing wrong in their life that they haven't got that and they've got savings? I, I paid my mortgage off when I moved up with Chrissy. We bought a nice big house and um, I got in the Premier League because they changed the points to money and I got to the World Final and I got 50,000. But that got me four Premier Leagues. Well, each Premier League money I paid off my mortgage. Each one paid off. And what I'd done was the rest of the year was made sure I earned enough to cover the tax and everything else for that money that I was paying my mortgage on. And that kept me going. I mean, your entire career, everything has been highlighted with how savvy you've been and how to make it work for you. But the one, the one thing that you regret He's not taking that advice from Peter Everson about looking after yourself physically. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, you just ignore it. Everyone, everyone has their own. I'm not, uh, you know, sports-minded in, in that respect. I, did, I played football, but I gave that up for that. Mm. Um, so I'm not going to go looking for... I can't swim. So, you know, there wasn't much out there for me to, to go and do. The, the gym started coming up. And when I moved to Carlisle, a gym sponsored me, and that was... The start of me losing weight. I mean, I actually lost three and a half stone before COVID, but then spent COVID putting the three and a half stone back on, which was sad. You know, I'd, I'd worked hard at been the Slimming World. Now, for a man to go to Slimming World, that's no good on you. It, it's quite hard, but uh, no, it's been a, it's been a cracking life, and I've loved every minute. And it, it's still work. It's still work in progress at the PDPA. Look, Peter, we could talk all day. We have done. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I look forward what to the part two. <laughs>